So hello everyone, um, my name is Anna McNally and I'm the Senior Archivist here at the University of Westminster and I'm here with my colleague Rebecca Jort, who's the Senior Records Manager at the University of Westminster. Um, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, this is an overview of the topics we'll be covering. If you're watching live, you can leave questions through the YouTube chat um, and if you're watching this recorded after it's finished, then there'll be an email address at the end for you to email us if you've got any questions. Feel free to leave questions throughout as they occur to you and we'll address them at the relevant moment, but we've also built in specific opportunities for you to ask questions at the end of each section. So this is the overview of what we'll um, be covering today. Um, we are looking at how we've used Archive Matica specifically here at the university, but hopefully there'll be some general um, stuff around digital preservation as well for those of you who aren't using that software package. Okay, so we are a team of five here at the university. We manage the university's archive. The university um, is over 175 years old, has four campuses, 2,000 staff and 20,000 students. Um, we also hold some depositive archives, mostly relating to town planning, and uh, we've recently started a garment collection. So we work generally all across these different aspects of our collections and no one person is responsible for all our digital records. We've been actively digitizing the collections for the past eight years. Uh, we follow best practice in terms of scanning and that we scan in high resolution into TIFF and we photograph in raw format and then convert to TIFF. In particular, we've had two large scanning projects with commercial providers. Uh, we've had two in-house projects and we do also do ongoing ad hoc digitization projects. We create JPEGs for day-to-day -day use, and so we only need occasional access to the high resolution for publication. Um, and as you can imagine, they were gradually sort of filling up our shared drives and starting to create a lot of issues, which Rebecca will talk about in more detail. We've also been accepting increasing amounts of digital material for the archive over the last few years. Initially, this was coming in on CDR, then by email, and now people have started turning up with whole hard drives for us to transfer. So we started transferring the material onto our normal shared drive, and we had to ask our IT department for more space. They set up a secure shared drive for us, but we quickly filled that up as well. And so we started talking to them about our storage requirements, which led us on to considering more formal digital preservation. So I'm now going to hand over to Rebecca to talk about the system that we use. So as I said, I'm going to talk us through um, the system that we currently use, um, how we actually use it, and also why we chose it, because we often get lots of questions as to why we've um, chosen the system that we've chosen. So to start with, for those that aren't particularly familiar with OAIS, um, it stands for Open Archival Information System, as it says on that slide there. And the reason I'm starting with this is because our digital preservation system is essentially mapped to this model. Um, we'll also be using um, a number of the acronyms that are part of um, OAIS, so I thought it'd be useful just to kind of have a baseline um, description for everyone. Um, very simply, OAS is just a conceptual framework for an archival system that's dedicated to preserving information over time. Now, our digital archival records follow a similar process to what you see in this sort of central, I suppose, part of this diagram. So very simply from left to right, they're created obviously at some point, um, they're prepared for ingest and a SIP or a submission information package is created. They're then ingested and an AIP is created or an archival information package. And the AIP is then stored in our archival storage. And should we choose to, we could provide access to that AIP by creating a DIP, which is a dissemination information package.
Okay, so when we talk about the process of preparing, ingesting and making accessible our digital archival records, we talk a lot about packages, which I've already sort of mentioned. So we use these sort of three sort of key acronyms or terms that are on the screen here. So I'm just going to really briefly run through them. So the SIP, um, as I said before, is the Submission Information Package. And it's essentially this sort of bag that's created prior to the ingest phase. And this will contain, or for us, it contains our digital archival records as well as some metadata. Um, the AIP, or Archival Information Package, is, um, I guess, really the key package and contains, again, all your original archival records, lots of really important um, metadata associated with those records, and, of course, your kind of preservation copies of those archival records if you've chosen to create them. Um, so these, from our point of view anyway, are the kind of packages or the bags that don't really get used or touched, but we store in our archival storage. And then finally, the DIP or the Dissemination Information Package. And this is essentially, I suppose, the access package, which we create from the AIP. Um, and it contains access copies of your digital archival records and, of course, some metadata as well. And these are the packages that can be pushed to applications um, like Atom, which is, which is the um, access to memory, the kind of cataloging and access um, package that, that partners with Archivematica or sort of other um, kind of um, applications that you're using for access by your users as appropriate. Okay, this slide shows um, a really basic diagram of what we're using in terms of the technology and also how our digital archival records move through the different applications. So that's really indicated by those red arrows that you can see on the screen. So I'm going to take you through this diagram really um, from left to right. So as Anna mentioned, I think at the start, we transfer most of our digitized and born digital archival records that we receive onto a dedicated internal share. Um, and that sits on our own internal infrastructure and is managed by our internal IT teams. And everything in that green box that takes up the best part of the slide um, is managed for us by Archivum. And this is essentially the Archivum Perpetua service or product. Um, now, all these applications that you see in this box are hosted externally for us. So essentially, this means we need sort of some way of, of bridging the gap between our internal storage and um, the storage essentially that's managed by someone else for us. So to do this, we have um, a nice little um, open source product called Nextcloud, which is that first bo green box on the left. Nextcloud is essentially, it's really essentially a sync and share application, a bit like Dropbox or Box or OneDrive, if you're familiar with all those. Um, and really it's kind of like a bridging application is how I see it. So essentially we can upload our records from our internal storage and we can do that either via browser interface or we can do it via um, the next cloud client, which we have on our laptops. And once all the records are kind of synced, they are essentially able to be seen in inverted commas by Archivematica. So Archivematica is the next one, the next green box on the right. Um, it's an open source digital preservation platform, essentially, really. And we access that by a, by a browser. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but very simply, this is where our records are, are prepared for pre preservation, really. Um, we currently create our SIPs, which I mentioned earlier, and our AIPs in Archivematica. We're not at this stage creating DIPs, but you can also create DIPs as well. So following those red arrows, then from Nextcloud to Archivematica, once we've created that AIP, that gets stored in our Archive 100 storage. Now, as part of the Perpetua kind of service or product, Archivum also provide us with a kind of support service for all the products. Um, so um, they've also just provisioned Atom for us as part of the Perpetua package. So that's kind of in that dotted box there because we're not fully up and running with that yet. And Atom will be our access module, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's essentially going to replace our cataloging software, which we'll be migrating over to in the next year or so. Okay, so just to go into a little bit more detail about the two sort of key products we're using. Um, so obviously, as I said, we're using Archivematica. 
And Archivematica is essentially really the uh, is a, sort of the workhorse, really. It does all of the um, preservation processes for us. It's an, a mainly an open source digital preservation platform. Um, and as I said, it's, it's really a big workflow engine and consists of a suite of kind of microprocesses or microservices that do all these little preservation activities on, on our, our born digital or digitized objects. Um, now, Archivematica is where all these packages are created, so the SIPs, the APES, the DIPs. Um, and it, it's sometimes of interest to some people, but we actually have Archivematica currently hosted for us on um, Amazon web servers. Um, and the Archive 100 storage is that other kind of um, integral part of the process for us, or the package. Um, it is essentially our archival storage. Um, that's where all our AOPs get stored. Um, it's ISO 27001 compliant for those of you that are interested in that, in that aspect of it. Um, another thing that's nice about Archive 100 storage, as well as actually Archive Massacre as an open source product, is that there's a very clear extraction process as well for your data, which was something that we were particularly um, keen on. Um, all of the data that's in the Archive 100 storage is held in the Archive and data centers for us. Okay, so I'm going to focus a little bit more now on um, Archivematica. Um, as Anna said, that's kind of the product that we've chosen to go with as the, as the main um, kind of part of our digital preservation tool set. Um, essentially, it's a really big workflow engine, as I mentioned earlier. It contains lots of these um, kind of microprocesses or microservices, which, which will run across all the records you push through Archivematica. So I'm going to briefly talk through three of the key tabs that we have so you can get an idea hopefully of what Archivematica looks like and some of what it does and some of how we've chosen to use it as well, because you can use it in, in lots of different ways, really. Um, the first thing I'll say is Archivematica is quite logical in that the preservation processes move from left to right across that top black bar that you can see there, which is very helpful. Um, so the first tab that you can see that we're on at the moment is the what we call the transfer tab. And this is basically where you create the SIP or the submission information package. So Archivematica runs through a number of different microprocesses on the records that you've chosen to process at this stage. And like most of Archivematica, you can kind of be as involved as you want in this process. So there are a number of points when you can instruct Archivematica to alert you to something before moving on to the next stage. Um, and this screenshot you can see, we've got a number of packages that are ready for transfer, but Archivematica has been instructed to wait until approval from us before moving on to the next stage. That's why you've got that little sort of alarm bell to the left, that little icon of each package. You can obviously, of course, choose to let Archivematica pass over these decision points should you wish. And that kind of leads more to automating the process as well. That's entirely up to you. Um, and this actually, as I said, goes for most of the settings in Archivematica, you can kind of change or amend them. Okay, on to the next one. So this is the ingest tab. Um, so once you've created the SIP, you've told Archivematica to go through all those processes, the workflow moves to this tab, which is the ingest tab. And this is the part of the process that results in the creation of the AIP, excuse me, or the archival information package. So again, Archivematica runs through a number of these kind of microservices. And you can see, hopefully, some of these listed on the slide. So one of the examples we've got there is that there is the normalization process where Archivematica will create, if you choose to, a preservation copy of the archival records that you've got there in a preservation format. So say we were to push some JPEGs through, um, it, would, it would then create a preservation copy for us, which we've told it to create um, as TIFFs. So you can also do things like specify which formats you would like Archivematica to normalize to if you wish. So again, you can be as involved or what as you want in these processes. You can ask Archivematica to go through all of these stages and not notify you of anything, or you can ask it to notify you at certain stages before moving on to the next stage. So as I said, the output of, of the ingest tab is usually the AIP, and then this gets stored for us in our Archive and 100 storage. OK, 
Okay, and moving on to the last tab um, I'm going to talk through. This is the archival storage tab. Um, so once your AIP has been created and stored, you can search for it within the storage tab in Archivematica. So as we've got some examples here, you can see, you can either search for the individual item or items within an AIP, and you can download the individual item should you wish, or you can choose to search across um, for an entire AIP and download the entire AIP, which will include the objects and all the metadata associated with that. So it's completely up to you. But this is, I mean, this is obviously not a, a, an access interface for a user, but it is a, a useful tool for, um, um, as archivists and records managers, I think, to be able to find your records. Okay, and finally, um, I'm going to talk through a um, specific way that we've chosen to kind of use Archivematica or sort of program it in a way. Um, so what you can see here at the moment is a screenshot of Nextcloud, which is that sort of bridging application that I, I kind of talked through at the beginning. Um, and this is the browser view of our Nextcloud instance. Um, so what we've chosen to do with Archivematica is actually um, automate the ingest of certain types of records. Um, and this whole process starts back in Nextcloud. Um, so we tend to automate um, kind of the processes a bit more with our digitized records where we know sort of what the formats are, what the content is, and we know basically the process that it we wanted to go through and what we want the output to be. So we're very clear about what we want to achieve. Um, so what we do is we start by transferring the records um, that we want to kind of ingest into the temp folder that you can see at the bottom of um, the screen there in Nextcloud. And then once we know the upload is complete, so we know it's synced with the server, we transfer everything that we want to kind of um, ingest into Archivematica into that automated folder, which is the second one from the top. Now, Archivum has set up a task for us that essentially instructs Archivematica to look at this automated folder periodically. And this means that Archivematica will automatically start the ingest process for the next new item it comes across in that folder and it will continue to do so at timed intervals until it sees no more new items. So we also have a specific processing configuration for this folder, this automated folder in Archivematica. So what this means is that Archivematica has a very specific set of rules that we've defined for it to follow for all content that it tr is transferred to the automated folder. So essentially what we've done with this is we've instructed Archivematica to pass through the process of SIP to APE to storage without any involvement from us, basically. So we don't need to go in and improve, approve anything for it to move on to the next stage. So this is really handy for us because it means, obviously, we can process records much more quickly. Um, it also reduces human error as well because we were having a few issues around that as well, remembering what we'd pushed through and what we hadn't. Um, and it also again, reduces the time we spend actually manually having to upload things to Archivematica and, and essentially push it all through. So um, I'm going to talk more now, the next few slides, about why we've chosen this particular solution and these sort of these products, really. Because as I said, we do get asked as to why we've chosen to go down this road. Um, so I think the main thing to start with is, as Anna touched on earlier, we've been increasingly taking in numbers of um, larger numbers, sorry, of born digital and digitized records in the last three to four years. Um, as, as I'm sure most archives have been. Um, and as a result, there has been increased pressure on our internal storage. So early last year, we worked with our infrastructure team, so um, as a team within our IT um, internal IT um, team, to come to a better solution for, a, um, for our kind of, what really are very specific requirements compared with what IT generally provision for the rest of the university. So we are quite, we do recognize that, that we are quite specific. So I think in the end, we chose archive and storage solution, obviously, as we've I've talked about. Um, one of the reasons for this was that we could procure it from the JISC data archiving framework, which was really useful for us because it's quicker, it's more efficient. And also there's standard terms and, and contract already in place, which was really helpful for us. Um, but we were also offered at the same time, sort of 
just shortly after the opportunity to trial Perpetua as well. So we obviously jumped at that. Um, but I think it's important to highlight that we were initially driven by the storage um, and the storage demands. So another really important thing for us about choosing the kind of solution or service that we've chosen to go with is that um, it's supported for us. So as we highlighted earlier, we're a small team and no one individual has responsibility for managing our digital archival records. We kind of fit it in around all the other things that we're doing. We don't have a dedicated digital archivist or anything like that. So it had to be part of, it had to be something that we could that make part of our kind of business as usual. So it was really important for us that we had a service that would be supported, including kind of managing our upgrades and any sort of new implementations, for example, with, with Atom. Um, and obviously the Perpetua package offered this service for us. So essentially Archive and provide technical support for us for Archivematica, Nextcloud, and obviously the underlying storage service as well. Um, we were very aware um, from the outset that we wouldn't have the time nor the level of expertise required to kind of investigate every issue or error message that we came across or to certainly not to manage our own upgrades or anything like that or any of these implementations and also we knew that it wasn't really the type of thing that our internal IT teams were kind of set up to do really. Okay, and finally for us, um, a final sort of important thing is that Archivematica and, and also the, actually the Archive and Storage are kind of actively used by other universities um, and the wider HR community and we saw this obviously as, as a big advantage. And Archivematica as, um, in particular as an open source product is actively developed by the community. So developments are, because it's, it's, um, it's obviously open source and non-proprietary and they therefore benefit the entire user community in the next kind of releases, uh, releases and updates. Um, an additional benefit of both the Archive 100 storage and Archivematica as well, um, which I've touched on before, is that we can exit both in a relatively easy and transparent fashion, which has not been the case for um, applications in the past. Um, so for our perspective as well, it was important that we could also extract ourselves from these, um, uh, these solutions. So we're just going to pause now um, in case anyone's got any questions. If you've got questions, please put them into the live chat on YouTube um, and then we'll answer them out loud for everyone. So we'll just have a couple of minutes pause here. So we've got a question about the transfer tab in Archivematica, which isn't a part of the OAIS, um, uh, the OAIS model, and whether or not we found it useful. Um, I think prior to the latest release of Archivematica, it seemed like just an initial stage where you were going through and just saying yes to everything. Um, but the latest release of Archivematica has made some changes to that so that you can now ingest material into Archivematica and then do some arrangement once it's in there. Um, so I think it may become a more useful tab in future. Um, at the moment, this is still sort of, we've only just had our Archivematica version upgraded. So it's something we're really just kind of looking at at the moment. Um, but it gives you, uh, we'll talk a bit more about this when we talk about sort of how we're dealing with large collections. Um, but it really gives you the option then to kind of move the collection into secure storage um, and then think about what you're going to do with it um, rather than having to do that material, that work on the shared drive. 
Um, we've also had a question about JPEG 2000 format. We have considered it, but I know that there are some concerns around it and TIFF just seems to be sort of the, the standard um, sort of uh, community-wide solution. So we're sticking with that because um, obviously the, the better used the format is, then um, the more likely there is there going to be preservation solutions for it in the future. Okay, so we're now going to move on to discussing our test phase. So we had an initial, we had um, we had Archive Matico installed in September 2016, and we moved into production in January 2017. So this is a test phase of only three months. I know some institutions have been testing for around a year. Um, our test phase was quite short due to the storage pressures that Rebecca talked about, and also because we were keen to get on with doing something um, rather than sort of trying to make it sort of a perfect um, solution. We had some formal training from archiving for a webinar, and then Rebecca and I both committed half a day a week to sort of playing with it, making small tweaks to the settings, and seeing how it responded to different types of files. At the end of the three months, we had a better understanding of how Archivematica worked, but we also had a lot of questions. So Archivematica, like any software, does what you tell it to. And we quickly realized that most of our questions weren't actually related to Archivematica at all, but to archival theory and processes and how these apply to digital records. Although in a lot of cases, the same principles can be applied without any problems. Some issues are unique to digital records. And most require you to be more aware of your workflows than you are with paper records. Although we've decided to move our catalogue data from CALM into ATOM now, when we started the process, that wasn't on the horizon at all. And CALM software doesn't talk to Archivematica, so we had to think about how we were going to create a link between our catalogue data and the files in the archive and storage. We decided to do this through the file name. Um, and so for digitised material, this meant titling the file with the reference number. But for born digital material, we were concerned about ensuring that the original file name was kept as part of the metadata. So this is something we'll um, demonstrate what we decided to do when we talk through the workflows in the next section. We also had to decide how to manage catalogued versus uncatalogued materials. Obviously, with paper records, you can just put them on the shelf until you're ready. And to some extent, that was how we were using our shared secure drive. But we didn't want to leave the material on the shared drive for too long, partly for storage reasons, but also because it meant we weren't carrying out any preservation processes on it. We made the decision that we were only going to catalog and process, process catalog material because of the issues with reference numbers. But that also meant that we need to prioritize the cataloging of di digital records once they were accessioned. So this has had a knock-on effect on some of our cataloging processes. As archivists, we like putting things into order. And what we found was that the digital material was often arriving with us before the physical material in a particular series. This meant that unless we held off cataloging digital material until we were sure we had acquired all the relevant physical material, which would be impossible, items would end up out of date order, which would make them more difficult to use. We also realized that digital is enabling the university to produce a lot more of some types of material, like marketing, whereas previously print costs might have restricted them. And so the numbering of some of our series was starting to creep up into the thousands. We've therefore taken the decision to split material up more. For the, us, this means we're doing it by academic year because it makes the most sense with our records. It means if physical material gets transferred later than digital material, this isn't a problem, as we can just go back and put it into the relevant year. It's also enabling us to catalogue digital material more quickly, as we know straight away where it's going to go.
One of the biggest questions that we had when we started and one we're still wrestling with is how much we put into a JIP. No matter how we structure the AIPs, we can still download a single file from them, um, which was one of our original sort of uh, requirements when we first got this system, that we wanted to be able to upload all our high resolution TIFF files and just be able to download one if we had a publication request for it. So in some ways, it doesn't seem to matter. But we're not sure what impact it might have later in terms of fixity checking. And now that we're linking um, the storage up with Atom, we're not really sure what impact it's going to have on the size of IARPs. In the early stages of using Archivematica, we were also uploading manually. But the fact that we can now set an automated upload makes it easier for us to either do lots of little AIPs or conversely very large ones. So this is still an ongoing conversation. So while the test phase led us to make a few tweaks to the settings in Archivematica, most of the work we had to do was intellectual, working out how to apply our existing workflows to digital records and deciding when some of those workflows needed changing to accommodate digital records. So we're going to take another short break here to allow time for people, for people to submit any questions they might have. And then we'll move on to looking at some of our workflows for both born digital and digitized material and some of our future plans. Um, so we've had a question about how easy it was to learn to tweak Archivematica. Um, I'd say it was relatively straightforward. It was, I mean, it's it's obviously doesn't look the same as the Windows environment, but if you're used to, to dealing with websites, I mean, it's all dealt with through a website. So there's just a series of drop down boxes and tick boxes. Um, so there was a certain amount of just kind of ticking boxes, changing settings and seeing what happened. And then follow up question, could you make any useful changes to that system? And if so, where? Um, I think one of the biggest um, wins for us was I think what I touched on earlier in that um, we can now set up specific processing configurations um, and push them to different kind of um, folders within Nextcloud, which is really helpful for us. So for our automated content before, what we were having to do is just set up the uh, work of the configuration in Archivematica. But if we wanted to manually push something through, we had to then change that configuration so you couldn't have two separate configurations but now we can which is excellent so it means that we can um it makes our life a lot easier with with some of these kind of where we've got big digitized collections that we just need to literally just needs to just be pushed through it's very straightforward so i think that was one of the biggest things that was so really for example we might have one one sort of workflow that we want to do for digitized material and then a different one for born digital and it allows us to create those distinctions yeah. um or something anything else where, for example, Archivematica throws up um, error messages, which it does quite a lot, um, depending on what you're putting through, particularly with kind of um, born digital stuff in particular. Um, it's quite helpful. We obviously, as I said, we have the support server, so where most of the time we're not necessarily able to understand what the errors are, but um, we do get feedback on, on from archive as to what's caused the problem. And then it's quite straightforward to go in and often to change that. It might be you need to change the tool, the specific tool that you're using um, within Archivematica. So, for example, there are lots, there are several different tools you can use to identify formats. Um, or it might be, for example, that um, uh, it, Archivematica doesn't necessarily recognize a particular um, file format, and you can go in and slightly tweak that and get it to transfer it into something else. So, um, I think once you know what the, the error is, it, it is relatively straightforward to then be able to go in and, and, and change it. But as I said, we have technical support for that. So if there's no more immediate questions, we're now going to talk through three different workflows. Um, as we said, do feel free to leave questions while we're talking, um, and then we'll answer them at the appropriate moment. So these three different workflows, we've got two for digitized material and one for born digital. Um, like a lot of people, we found it very easy to get intimidized, intimidated by digital records. 
But what we found was that by considering some of the issues with digitized records first, it was much easier to extrapolate principles and workflows for use with the born digital records without getting intimidated by their digital nature. So we're going to talk through how we sort of moved from thinking about digitized material through to thinking about born digital. So the first collection is a collection of 3,000 photographs um, from the 1970s and 80s. Obviously, with older photographs, so say from the 1880s, um, we've traditionally catalogued every single one. Um, but these collections are now reaching the numbers where it's neither possible or, nor sensible, because they're often multiple shots of the same subjects. For us, most of our photograph collections were produced by the university for marketing purposes, so they'll often be in a file with the name of the course and then sort of 10 or 20 very similar photographs of students in a classroom setting. The, these particular photographs were organised by subject, um, but there were a differing number of photographs in each envelope and often more than one envelope with the same subject. We took the decision to leave them in the original order and not combine or split packets and to only catalogue them at file level. They were scanned by an intern um, and she went through numbering them as she scanned them so that the reference numbers and the digital image numbers matched. These were then saved to our secure shared drive in folders um, that corresponded to the envelopes that they were found in. So we made the decision to upload each one of the folders to Archivematica as one AIP. Um, and so each packet of photographs is stored digitally exactly as it is stored physically in our strong room. And then because this was done while we still had CALM, we then had to create item level records in CALM and manually attach a JPEG to each item level record in order for them to be viewable online. With Atom, it will be much easier to attach that whole AIP to the file level um, and then have it create those item level records underneath. So the second workflow is for a set of 30,000 slides that we had digitized by a commercial company. These are the same series as the photographs that I just talked about. They're all photographs taken by the university for use in prospectuses and other marketing materials. But by this point, that they were the rather than being produced as black and white photographs, they were being produced as color slides. Um, and as you can see, there were 10 times more. Um, so they were organized in sheets, and each sheet had a title. Due to the quantity um, of slides, the, we didn't want to number each one individually um, because it's highly unlikely we'll be looking at the physical versions again unless we decide to re-digitize them in the future. We therefore had to manage them almost as if they were born digital records once we received the scans back from the commercial company. Um, but knowing there was a physical object in the strong room helped us think through some of these issues. So um, as before, we, um, we catalogued them at file level. And this took the information from the labels on the hanging sheets and from looking at the digital images to make sure that they were indeed on the correct hanging sheet. Um, and in, in each case, the file name of the um, digitized slide eff effectively creates a physical location for the original slide because it tells us we're, what box we're in. So we were keen not to lose that information. Um, we therefore uh, appended the catalogue reference to the start of each file name so that we can find the digital image with the catalogue reference, but we could also go back and find the original slide from the digital image as well. Each group of images is then saved as a folder onto the shared drive and then uploaded as one AIP. Um, the images aren't actually available online yet, but they will be when we move across to Atom. OK, 
Okay, I'm going to talk through the last workflow, which is our Born Digital um, Oral Histories. We do have an oral history programme at the University of Westminster, and we interview staff, ex-staff, and our um, alumni students. So all of our interviews are recorded at the moment as MP3s, and um, we catalogue each recording at item level, and similar to what Anna talked about before. Um, we cut the, the file, um, or the folder at least, is retitled with the same reference. So we have um, OHP is, is the font level description. So every every um, uh, interview is OHP and then, and then the number. So the folder is always titled OHP underscore um, 52 or whatever the next number in the sequence is. So we also create um, an index of the recording. Um, and we also ensure that we are scanning the recording agreement because we'll get the individual to sign obviously um, a proper agreement. Um, we save the recording agreement alongside um, the uh, actual um, Born Digital um, audio file on our shared drive. And they're, t they're saved in a, in a um, folder that's specifically titled as per um, what's on that screen. So it's in a folder titled Submission Documentation. So we then upload the recording and the submission documentation folder all in one big folder to Nextcloud, and then it gets pushed through Archivematica as one um, package, as one AIP. Now, Archivematica understands that submission documentation folder as basically meaning there's metadata in there about the object. So we use this functionality um, in different ways, but generally to transfer kind of any associated administrative records. In this case, it's the consent form, but it might be, for example, um, a transfer or deposit form. Um, and we always do that along with the records that they relate to. So it's kind of a useful little bit of functionality from Archivematica. So we then um, obviously once the AIP is created, the audio file, the associated documentation, they're all stored in our Archive in 100 storage. And then finally, just to finish this one off, we do have interviews. Um, they're available to listen to in our reading room on site. Um, but we also have some of the actual excerpts are also available on our website as well. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk through what are mostly questions that we have at this stage um, about large and complex digital accessions. So just those are some of the sort of key sort of queries that we have. So I'm just going to talk through a few of them. So I think so the, one of the bigger ones for me as a records manager particularly is that first one that we have on the left, which is how we manage records that we receive, which still create and um, kind of maintain a current function in the institution. So a good example is that we we have had and we continue to get um, accessions of records from um, senior staff when um, uh, they leave the institution, and often these contain obviously sensitive information in in terms of personal data, but particularly um, now increasingly they are commercially and time sensitive data in there as well. So essentially, what we're receiving is current and semi current records. They're records that we want, but you know, historically, we would be receiving them much further down the line where some of those sensitivities are kind of less um, uh, current and pertinent. So there are obviously a number of issues around this, in particular, how do we appraise these records? Um, how do we how do we catalogue them? How do we make do we make catalogue data available about them? Um, how do we actually as archivists and records managers, how do we effectively manage them? Um, and I think it's also been quite interesting for us because we've had, um, I think, to go back to some of our processes in terms of access and provision of access to these types of records and also um, the information that we make available about these records through, through our um, public facing catalogue. And also going back to actually how are we transferring them? What terms do we have? What does staff understand um, by transferring these records to the archive? So um, that's been quite an interesting one. Um, the second one is sort of how do we record 
um, what the arrangement was of something, uh, a large accession that we receive, um, and how do we record what we might remove. Um, so should we spend time on arrangement with born digital records? I think it's an interesting question. And if we do choose to do so, at what stage in the process from accession catalogue to access do, at where, where do we start to start that process of, of arrangement? Um, what should we be removing? Should we be removing anything? And if we don't remove sort of early on in the process, how do we then manage those records appropriately? Um, another one then is how much do we want to review records before we catalogue them, which sort of ties in with the last point really. Um, we do get, as I said, we do get, we are getting large digital accessions, basically born digital accessions or, or kind of accruals. Um, and there is a real question for us around how much we can actually review these. We're not entirely sure at this stage, but it's likely that we're not going to be able to review them in any great depth or, or with any great granularity, um, just purely because of the volume. Um, so this poses, again, a number of questions around, um, and a, a key one that I think about, um, is how do we check for personal data or other sensitivities? Like, at what stage do we do that? And how do we practically do that as well? And how do we record that information? And finally, um, what does good enough look like for us? So by this, um, I think it is very much relevant for large and complex digital accessions that you get in, but also I think for digital preservation as a whole, actually, what does good enough look like and what does it look like for us? So um, when are we gonna, does it have to be perfection or what kind of parameters are we willing to accept? Um, so quite a, a granular example is, for example, if you had sort of 100 PDFs that you were trying to normalize to a PDFA in Archivematica and two fail, do you start again or do you accept that as an acceptable level of failure and continue on through your processing? So what are your parameters for good enough? Um, so I think this is something that we've really kind of realized that we need to get to grips with and have started to think about a bit more. So this webinar of us has been very much about sort of looking at our first year and how we've sort of just got off the ground. Um, for plans for the future, um, we're in the process of moving to Atom, as we've mentioned, um, which will make for smoother workflows as it can talk to Archivematica. So at the moment, we've not been creating GIPs as part of Archivematica, but we will be doing so in future, and then we can put more of our digital records onto our catalog without having to manually attach them as we do in Calm. Uh, we'll also be taking part in a GIST research project, of which this webinar forms part. And we're going to be investigating some of the issues Rebecca's talked about, about digital preservation in a records management context, looking at the transfer of current and semi-current digital records to archives. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and for your questions today. Uh, we'll stay here for the next sort of five, 10 minutes on the chat in case there are any final questions. And after that, you're welcome to contact us by uh, email. The webinar has been recorded and we'll be available to watch back as soon as we close the live session. So thank you all for joining us today. We just have one final question about whether we're using write blockers or any other specialist hardware prior to ingest. At this stage, no, we're not. Um, we are primarily focused on institutional records, so um, most of what we get is um, from our own internal infrastructure. Um, so things like um, virus checking and all that sort of stuff. We're not too worried in terms of what we're actually receiving from people from that perspective. Um, 
I think probably the, the probably simplest way to put it is we haven't actually yet looked at that sort of stuff, to be honest. Um, as kind of we've both talked about, particularly Anna, it was this year was really about sort of just trying things out, getting started, getting off the ground, learning some of the basics. That may well be something that we start to look at going forwards as well, particularly for things that we may get from our academics and things like that. Ed, that's fine if you'd like to uh, email us or arrange yes, a visit. I'd like to thank Ed Pinson for his many questions yes. today. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a question about whether we had um, any difficulty communicating the need for a digital preservation solution for our IT de to our IT department. Um, in some respects, no, uh, because we have a very good, we're lucky, we have a very good working relationship with our IT teams. Um, I think because this was driven at first by storage, um, IT could very quickly see that um, uh, it was quite resource intensive supporting us just from that perspective. So they were very keen from the outset to find a suitable solution for us, whether that was something that we did in-house, because we did look at in-house options with the infrastructure team, or whether it was something that we outsourced. So actually, I think we were very lucky in that they were very supportive. I mean, we did, obviously, I did write out kind of baseline requirements that we, we, we would need from our storage option if we were going to do something different. Um, so we didn't sort of just go in with, with mad requests that didn't have any any factual basis to them so um, we did kind of try to make it as clear as possible and articulate as clear as possible why we were asking for what we were asking for and obviously it is also about compromising as well you can't you're never going to get everything that you want so um, but no in general they were they were very supportive so I think we were quite lucky with that um, it should also be mentioned we've had to put in a, a case for getting the budget for um, for this for Perpetua going forward um, because obviously we'd, we'd made the payment for the storage, um, but then we had to sort of decide whether we were going to carry on using Perpetua on top of that. And we've really just been arguing that it is the equivalent of having another strong room um, for us, basically, that this is how we're going to be acquiring the majority of our records in future. And particularly for us being in a central London campus, we're right by Oxford Circus. So when we tell people we need another strong room, but it's going to be digital, that actually looks like quite a good deal. <laughs> them rather than trying to find another room for us on the campus yeah Ha, ha, ha. 